Hey guys, welcome to Fearless TV. If you want to find out anything about Fearless LA, follow us on Instagram at fearless underscore LA. And if you have a prayer request, go ahead and go to our Fearless TV page and fill one out. The following message you're about to watch is from our Palm Sunday experience. I hope you enjoy. Mark chapter 11, verse number one, and I, I want to I read this story, and many of us have heard, how many have heard the story of Palm Sunday? You've actually read it, maybe you looked it up online and said, what does Palm Sunday mean? Does it mean God loves Southern California and the palm trees, because we keep having palm trees and all our stuff, or is there more to the Palm Sunday? And so I, I did the same, and I, I got to the text, the four different text that Palm Sunday reflects on, and I just ask the Lord to give me a deeper perspective on this same old story, and, and sometimes uh, we've heard stories. Anybody grow up in church in this room? Anybody not grow up in church? You, you didn't grow up in church? Awesome. Okay, cool. Uh, so we got some homies right here, so just be careful if you cross any of these two dudes. They didn't grow up here, man. They, 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 they need Jesus, and we, we love those two guys. And uh, it's, it's, it's unique that two of you probably help with our security more than often uh, because you're like, there's dudes like me coming into this building. And uh, so we're excited, man, for both sides of the coin. But, but if, you've, if you've heard this story before, the story of Jesus coming into the city, raise your hand. You've heard the story, the triumphal entry. It's found in all four Gospels about Jesus. And really, if you read all four, that I encourage you to do so this week, is to read all the Gospels, uh, just the section of what happened during this week before Easter. Uh, and I also want to encourage you to invite people to Easter next week, okay? Look, can I tell you this? If you invite them, they will come. I promise you that. People are looking for somewhere to go on Easter. Craigslist it. Whatever you got to do, put it out there. Instagram it. Not all of you are catching it right now. I'm, I'm saying, if you invite Whoever is in your life, they will come to church next week. And guess what? They could be transformed for all of time. And not because I have something special, but because God has something special for them. And, uh, and, and it's just a time where people come to church. So invite them. Um, it's going to be incredible. But Mark chapter 11, verse number one. I, I want to look at a different take on this verse as we read it. This is just one of the, uh, one of the takes on uh, the event that happened when Jesus uh, announced who he was. Uh, now, I do want to. I do want to preface this bef before we go into it. Is is that uh, up until this point, Jesus had not yet said out loud, uh, "I am the Son of God." Uh, in, in fact, it was almost like a mystery to most. I mean, Jesus was doing the things that they said the Messiah was would do, and uh, we need to understand that the, the Jewish community was waiting for their Messiah. They were waiting for this king to show up, this Messiah, Jesus, to show up. And Jesus was him, but they didn't for sure know if he was who he said he was because there were lots of teachers in his time. There were lots of uh, Jewish leaders, and there were lots of people uh, that, that were baptizing and being baptized. Uh, in fact, all the different being baptized simply meant that you were now uh, baptized into uh, the the. Uh, the thought process of that leader that you were following. So Jesus had people that were baptized and followed him and disciples, and so did a lot of different leaders at that time. So people would look at Jesus, and uh, people would many times, even the devil, I don't believe the devil even knew who Jesus was. Because uh, if he would have, he wouldn't have killed him. Because <laughs> if he's Jesus, he has power over death. Uh, do you understand that? So even the devil didn't know. Even in the garden, he was trying to get him to say, who are you? Who, uh, if, if you're really God, throw yourself down. He was really trying to test, is this the one? Is this the one? And you got to understand that this had been over 4,000 years at this moment since God had, had promised the serpent who took the authority from Adam and Eve, I will send a seed, the son of man, and you will bruise his heel, but I will crush your head. And so this whole time, Satan was looking, and another one bites the dust, and another one bites the dust, and another one bites the dust, into 4,000 years later, here comes Jesus. And, and, and you know, you know uh, Peter was the first one to actually blurt it out. You know, that, that moment, it was like he couldn't contain it, and the Holy Spirit just took him over. He said, who, are, who do you say I am? I say you are the Christ! And he just, you know, I can almost picture him in that moment, and it just hit the atmosphere, it shook the atmosphere. I can imagine in that moment, then Jesus turns to Peter and said, you didn't get that from man. Oh, the Holy Spirit's letting you in on sea. 
secrets, huh? You got that from God. Now keep it shut. Jesus would often, like, after he'd heal people, he'd say, don't tell anyone. <laughs> he would often, why? Because it wasn't his moment yet. Yeah, and, and Jesus, uh, so, so I, I want to read you this, and I, I want to read you, and, and I, I feel like we're going we're gonna to get something out of this today. Um, so here we are. Jesus is making it very plain and clear to the Jewish people that I am the Messiah, because this moment was written about before he was ever born. Several times. Mark chapter 11, verse number one. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethiant, the Mount of Olives. Somebody say Mount of Olives. Now I want you to know that it was prophesied that the Messiah would come from the Mount of Olives. He would come riding through the Mount of Olives. So here's this epic place, this, this, this spot that it was prophesied the Messiah would appear. Jesus sent two, somebody say two. two. Come on, say it like you mean it. Two. two, two right there. Two of his disciples, somebody say disciples. It was not just anybody, it was two disciples, it was two followers. He sent them saying to them, go, somebody say go. go. If you haven't figured this out yet, this is gonna be real interactive. Somebody say go. Go to the village. Somebody say village. Yes. Jesus sent how many? Yes. Two. What were they? Yes. And he had them go to where? Yes. Go to the village. He didn't have them go to church. Although we know that they probably were the church because they were disciples of Jesus. He didn't have them go to the steeple. He had them go to the people. God is sending disciples, not alone, but he wants to send disciples in this room See, I want to tell you this about fearless. Fearless is not about church. It's not about a room. It's not about a service. Fearless is, is, a, is, is a place. Uh, it's a new way of living every day. God wants you to be fearless. And he doesn't want you to be alone. Look, you were never called to do this race alone. So if you're trying to do it alone, you missed it. You're not going to make it. God sent them out, not alone. He sent them out in twos. He sent them out together. Look, touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, I guess I need you. <laughs> he sent the disciples out into, and then he said this. This gets really crazy, and I don't know if you've ever read this like this, but I want to help you because sometimes if you talk to the Bible, it will talk back, okay? Say, talk to me. He says, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. <laughs> then it gets real Jedi Knight there. You will find a colt tied next to a barn with two pelican, and they will speak to you. And then you will ask the colt. No, here. So this is my own version. This is, I kind of get caught up in this. If anyone asks you, look, notice Jesus doesn't, he doesn't tell them, like, go ask someone if you can borrow their colt. You, you, you're reading this, right? He says, go find a colt. It's been prepared and take it. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, take it. Come on. So Jesus, what Jesus is saying is, look, down the street, on, uh, I've dropped a pin to you. Uh, and, and let me tell you this. There's a pin. I've dropped it. There's a Dodge. Uh, not a Dodge. No, 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 not a Dodge. There, there, is, there is a Toyota Prius that is ready for you. I want you to go to it and take it. And if anyone asks you what you're doing, look at this. <laughs> you get this right. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? <laughs> Can you picture this? Why are you doing this? Say to them, the Lord needs it. <laughs> there's a Dodge, there's not a Dodge, there's a, I keep getting mixed up. There's a Toyota Prius out there. I've dropped the pin. Nick, I need you to go take it. You too, leather jacket, come on. You're gonna get your leather jacket, you're gonna go down there. Come on, Chewie, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna look, you're gonna, I need you to flex a little bit. Don't be afraid of them. If they confront you, you just look at them and say, PJ needs it. <laughs> this is what they don't want me to do. This is this story. And so the Bible says that these disciples are rowdy, man. Maybe, maybe some of you would say, I don't know if I could believe that the, the, the donkey was there. I mean, Jesus is, is revealing right now his lordship. He's revealing his perfect timing. He's revealing that in time, 
he also stands outside of time. And then if he said the donkey's going to be there, the donkey's going to be there. And how crazy is it that the disciples just go? I mean, you ever just read this? Like almost like robots that get up and just, okay, they don't even ask. No questions. No like, hey, is there like, okay, what if, what if? Uh, you, you, ever, you ever had someone tell you something that's crazy and then you had like a 32 point question seminar to find out if they knew what they were talking about. Like, what if this happens? What if? But they just go. What kind of faith is that? But they had that kind of faith because they just watched Lazarus get up from the grave. When you see a dead person rise at someone's word, the next call to get a donkey. Oh, I got that, baby. I got you. You want me to do that? Okay, I'm down, man. Is he a dead donkey? And this is what I want to tell you before I go any further, that God is God has your life ordered in steps. Something that you're facing today could actually be perpetuating you to get through tomorrow. Something you're walking through right now, look, is, is actually, it's actually a setup. You see, the devil is, is gotten you thinking that God forgot you, but no, God hasn't forgot you. He's prepared you, and he has a plan for you, and he's ordered steps for you, and you are walking in front of something right now. You are facing a Lazarus right now that is actually preparing you to go alone to the next thing and believe him for what he said. Look, because once a dead person gets up, what is a donkey? Come on, I got this donkey. Look, today wasn't my first day on the job. I've had to face some stuff. People always want to do what you do until they have to go through what you had to go through to get to where you're at. Everybody wants to be a disciple, but nobody wants to believe for a dead person to get up. But that's what it means to be a disciple. If there are things you're struggling with what God said to do right now, maybe it's because you bypassed the storm, asked him to get you out of it when he was going to save you through it. Maybe we need to go back to the last place we heard him speak and say, God, you have made me more than a conqueror. <laughs> more than what's facing me, more than what's against me, more than, look, what is more than? It's more than. So why is this thing still more than God? What if we looked at the thing that's in front of us and said, this is just a test Oh, okay, God, you still got my back. This is just a setup so I can walk with you in the dark if I could. And so they go. They go and they, they went and verse four, they found a colt, just as he said, outside in the street. It was tied in a doorway. Somebody say doorway. As they untied it, somebody say untie it. Come on, somebody say, untie it. Fully untied. Some people standing there asked, and it happened, what are you doing? That's my donkey. Why are you untying that colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them, and the people let him go. When they brought the colt to Jesus, it's like, okay, cool. When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and while others spread branches, thus why we call this Palm Sunday, they had cut in the fields. Those who went on ahead of those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. Now look at this. Watch this climatic ending. Watch this. How powerful is this? He looked in the temple, but since it was already late, he went home. <laughs> you see that? You ever just read the Bible and like, wow, this thing is interesting. Let's go to Luke. Luke's gospel. Luke chapter uh, 19, verse number 38. says this blessed. This is, the, uh, this is the, how Luke heard the song that they were singing. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now watch this. Peace in heaven. Somebody say peace in heaven. Peace in heaven. And glory in the highest. Glory. Come on, say it like you mean it. Peace in heaven, peace in heaven. and glory in, the glory in the highest. Then it says some of the Pharisees, or we can say religious people. <laughs> Y'all you, you have met some of those, right? Some religious people in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher. I, I, fi I find it funny how they call him the teacher, but they're trying to teach him. 
Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And then he says, I tell you. I love how Jesus, Jesus is bad, man. I tell you, he replied, if they keep me quiet, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. I started asking God, who am I in this story? You ever ever done that? You ever just come? And at first I thought I was the crowd. I don't want to be them because that's the same crowd that cried out Hosanna and then cried out crucify him. I was worshiping in the crowd. And then I'm like, nah, I'm not part of that crowd. And then I thought I was the disciples. and, And I think that now into my life, I'm trying to become that. But I really found myself in the story as the cult. I'm, I'm like Shrek's movie. I, I am the donkey. I, I don't know. If, uh, you ever try to find yourself in the story and realize you're not the character you wanted to be? <laughs> when I looked at the story, I, I realized I'm the donkey. Because Jesus sent two disciples to untie Something that had spent its life tied up. (sighs) You see, there was a point in my life where someone with skin and bones came into my life and believed in the call that had been sent out even if I hadn't heard it. There was someone that showed up into my now. I love that it says that the donkey was tied up and it had never been used. It had, at this point in its life, no purpose, nothing to write about, nothing to talk about. All it had was, I've been at this post for a long time. I guess this is my lot in life, is to be here tied up by somebody else. I wish I had the power to untie myself, but my hands don't work that way. And they tied me up so I would stay here. And I guess I'll die here. But one day, someone with flesh and blood showed up into my life and said, there is more in you. There is a call on your life. There has been a call sent out by one who has seen you and has prepared you. See, some of you have been tied up for a long time and you feel like God has forgotten you. God hasn't passed you by. He's actually prepared you. The donkey was born for such a moment as this. If you could be any donkey, this would be the one to be the one that was prepared before up. The one that Jesus had chosen. What if you're chosen and you don't realize it? But because of your circumstance, you're stuck at the post that they stuck you at. The words they tied you to. The life, the, the, the house you were born into. I was born in the ghetto, so I'll always be in the ghetto. I was born in poverty, so I'll always be in poverty. I, I was born with fear, so I'll always have fear. It's not a fear will be there, it's will you have fear or will fear have you? And they show up to the donkey and they untie it. And for the first moment in its life, it sees its purpose. I'm the donkey. I'm just a young cult that somebody had heard the call of God, even though I didn't hear it. They had heard what God had said about, you know what I'm here today to do? I'm here to do what someone did for me. I'm here to be one of those disciples of Jesus and to untie some cults in this room, to untie some donkeys in this room. You may be stuck to where you're at. You may be bound to where you're at, but just one moment, just one moment can shift everything. Today, we are still preaching about this donkey. It's the most famous donkey of all time. We don't even know its name, but we know its purpose. Jesus says, bring it to me. I love, too, that it says that the donkey was tied to a post standing between a doorway. 
because many of you have seen what you're called to do. You are stuck from where you're at to where God's calling you to. And the, 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 the in-between is killing you. The in-between is destroying you. You have a vision. God, I've called to the nations. God, I'm called to raise up an army in my city. God, I'm called to preach the gospel. God, I'm called to change the world through acting. God, I'm called. You have a call and a destiny and you can see it, but you can't taste it. Because you're stuck from where you are to where he's called you to. He was halfway in between, tied up by somebody else. And notice it took somebody to come in and untie him. Some of us are waiting for God to show up, but God has sent a warrior. God has sent a disciple. God has sent a pastor. God has sent a leader. God has sent a podcast. I don't, I don't care what it is that God sent. What I want to know is are you fully untied? Are you still sitting at where you were waiting to go to where you are? Because Jesus is calling for a vehicle to come into the city. He's looking for a cult that has been prepared before time. And he's calling you. You see, maybe the reason you haven't found your purpose is because your purpose is not anything they could give you. It's something that he wants to appoint you to. Here is Jesus. The Bible says they bring the donkey to Jesus. It's nice that you're meeting me, but to meet me is not your purpose. The call is to meet him. Many people get mixed up in the call because we think the call is the vision of the end. But the call is simply to be a vehicle that Jesus comes in on. The call could be a smile on my face to my coworkers. The call could be me getting up and being on time to work and staying extra to show that Jesus is a part of this story. I'm not here alone. I know you just see the donkey. Can I tell you this? Then the Bible says they laid their coats on the donkey. This is what I want. I want to untie you and I want to lay my coat on you. I want to put my coat on you. The mantle that God has placed on my life. The call that God has put on my life. I want to put it on you and reveal that you have power inside of you to do even what I'm called to do. This is a, this is not a singular call by Pastor Jeremy. This is what the word is. I'm cloaking you with the word today. I'm cloaking you with the resources of heaven today. I'm cloaking you so that Jesus won't have to touch the old you. He can touch the you that you've been cloaked with. See, this is the power. And then the Bible says that they begin to lay their cloaks on the street. They laid their cloaks on the donkey and the people begin to, the crowd begin to lay their cloaks on the street. To lay their cloak on something meant they were giving all they had to it. You say, why do you preach like that? Because today I'm giving you all I have. This is all I have. I'm going to go for broke. I'm going to swing for the fence. And if I strike out, praise the Lord, I'm going to hit it again next time. I'm going to give you everything I have. This is the picture of leadership. This is the picture of being a disciple of Jesus. Is to lay down everything you have so he can enter into the city. To lay down everything I have so I can preach. To lay down everything I have so I can sing. To lay down everything I have so I can start a business. No, no. To lay down everything I have so Jesus can have a path to the people. He laid it down. They began to worship him. You ever wonder why Jesus took 4,000 years to show up? Adam to Jesus. You ever wonder why, why it wasn't just four days, four hours, four minutes since God looked at the serpent? Why did God let the serpent become a dragon? You ever, you ever just talk to the Bible? Like this thing doesn't make sense. Like you ever just looked at it and said, I mean, just being honest, you ever just wondered why is it not Genesis chapter like 12 that Jesus shows up? Why did he wait? Till, till Matthew? Why did he have to go through all the prophets? And why do we need Samson? And why do we need Deborah? And why, why do we need all this in-between stuff? The Bible could have been a short cliff notes. Like, why couldn't it have been like a children's story? Like, we have one page, and then the next page, Jesus, like he tells the snake, since you've came after man, through the seed of man, I will destroy you. Why, why does he wait 4,000 years? I always thought this, is it, is it because Jesus wasn't ready? 
Like we had a, he had a train, Kung Fu Panda Part Three. He had to get ready. He had to prepare for the evil warlord that was coming. I mean, did he was he not strong enough for the devil? So Rocky Chapter, you know, uh, Part Three. He's out there in the, in the snow of heaven, just like trying to box and get ready. I mean, is this what we believe? Is that we believe that God was like sitting in heaven, like, oh God, this is gonna this, myself. This is gonna be very difficult. We're gonna have to come up with a plan here. We need like some. What, what do you think his name could be? You think we? What do you think they could call him? Jesus. Oh, that's a good one. Put that on the whiteboard. We'll, we'll put it in the program. We'll make sure it all fits out. No, no, God, the Bible says that the lamb was slain before the foundations of the world. God already had this thing rigged from the beginning. So why 4,000 years? Was it because Jesus wasn't ready? No, it was because time wasn't ready. Jesus was waiting for time to catch up to what was coming. Jesus was waiting for a kingdom on earth to be most like his kingdom he was setting up so that he could help the people understand what he came to do. And the kingdom that showed up was the kingdom of Rome. It's a powerful kingdom. You see, Rome did it different. Rome, we know that when you're in Rome, do as the Romans do. We know that all roads lead to Rome. We know that Rome was a superpower. At their time, had taken over more land, conquered more cities than any other uh, dynasty of its time. And then thousands of years after, no one would even compete or compare. We know that Rome had a powerful population rate. We know that it, it, it grew incredibly fast. But we know that Rome was a kingdom. You see, I, I want to tell you this before we move on any further. Jesus is not the head of a religious organization. <laughs> Jesus is not a, a religious figure. In fact, Jesus came to destroy religion. <laughs> so all of you that think we're just another religion here, no, no, that's what the cross, it was the religious people that killed Jesus, and it's the religious people that are killing Jesus in you. Jesus didn't come to be the head of a religion because he never preached about a religion. He preached kingdom. Over and over, he preached kingdom. Jesus was not the head of a religion. He was the head of a kingdom. Jesus was a king. And he waited 4,000 years to show up into time so that there would be a kingdom on earth that would reflect what he was trying to say to his people. You see, the Romans did not show up in a city like other kingdoms had. Other kingdoms that show up in a city that kill all the men of warring age. They'd rape the women to ensure that their seed was in the next thing. This is what religion does. It kills all the men. It ensures that its seed continues, manipulates, orchestrates. And then it takes the young men as captives and brings it into where they're at. This is what religion does. If you want to be a part of this, you have to come to where I'm at. If you want to do this, you have to dress like this, talk like this, act like this, walk like this. But that's not what relationship does. So the kingdom of Rome would not grab people out of their cities and bring them to theirs. They would invade their city. They would send a delegate from their camp as a one that would set up something new in the new kingdom. And that person would be fully Rome while they were fully in the other country. Doesn't the Bible say we are aliens and strangers of this land? That we are ambassadors of Christ Jesus? You see, Jesus came as a king from a kingdom. He came to the kingdom of earth to let the enemy know. Let me tell you this. I don't have time to get into all of this, but it's powerful. Jesus did not come on a colt, a horse. He came on a colt, a donkey. The people... How, how unique is it? They, they come out and they, they start, they start uh, worshiping with palm branches. They start singing the same song. Isn't this weird? There's no organization structure. Deanna can assure this. Like she runs the organization of our church to get us just to sing the same song on Sunday. You know how much work that takes? We gotta have practices. We gotta write. Uh, we have this new thing called Trello. It keeps us all organized. There's like 32 emails that have gone back and forth just to get that graphic on the screen. But somehow... All these people show up 
with their palm branches. I mean, if we tried this, I think someone would forget. Oh, I forgot mine at home. It would have been me. I didn't bring my palm branch. Pastor, we got an extra one for you. Praise. But all of them show up with their palm branches. Uni in unison, they lay down their jackets. They start singing the same song with no words. It was because all this was prophesied before Jesus showed up. And they were ready for this Jesus, this Messiah. After 4,000 years of being enslaved, and now Rome showing up and taking over your land. Oh, we can't wait for the Messiah. Is this him? They were so excited that maybe Jesus would be him. They did exactly what the book prophesied they would do. They worshipped him. This, was, this worship song was found in, in, in Psalms. It was a song that they knew that the king, they would sing over the king, laying down the palm branches. That was a, a sign of triumphal entry that Jesus would come, tri that he would, they would come into the city. And here's Jesus coming back to turn over the tables of the Roman government and set us free. <laughs> and he comes in riding a donkey. <laughs> If he was a warring king, he would have been riding a horse. But it comes in. You know what's unique about these people? I can see them even in their song kind of shutting down as they're singing because Jesus doesn't come and show up how they thought he would come. In their minds, the Messiah would come, turn over the tables of the Roman Empire, and set up shop here on earth. But Jesus comes born in a manger, humbly through a virgin. Jesus comes exactly how the book said it was, but they weren't reading the book. They were reading what they wanted him to be from their pain. Isn't this what we do? And we actually read the book. Can I tell you this? The Bible says in this life, you will have many trials and troubles. But yet when we start going through trials, we're like, Hosanna, oh, crucify him. He's not Jesus. He's not the God of this. Oh, I can't believe I lost my job. Oh, God, I signed up for this. And then it goes backwards. Come on, God. Are you even with me? Mm. Hosanna, crucify him Monday. Hosanna on Sunday, crucify him on Tuesday. This is exactly what the people did because he showed up in a way that they had not expected. He showed up riding a donkey. He could have been riding a horse that would have meant he was bent on war. He could have been riding a, a mule, which is a donkey and a horse mixed together, which David rode on and the kings, the Jewish king. But he showed up riding on a donkey, a beast of burden, a pack animal. He didn't show up galloping like you see in the movies. He showed up on a donkey. The only thing a donkey represented was peace. Ah. He came to make peace. But can I tell you this? He didn't come to make peace with the devil. He came to make peace with himself. He came to be the peace offering on behalf of God so that God would have no more walls. You see, we were at war with God. And God said, I need, a, I need a perfect one. I need myself. And I'm going to go down because the enemy has taken what I love and put what I hate in what I love. So he's caused me to love what I hate and hate what I love. So instead of them dying, I'm going to ask you to die in their name so that they can live in your name. So Jesus came and the devil thought he was trying to make peace with him. But he's like, no, you're just you're just a byproduct of what's happening. You've already been removed from heaven. I'm not. It's not yin and yang. God's not trying to defeat the devil. We always pray like that. Oh, kick the devil out. of No, no. God's already kicked the devil out of Dodge. You don't need to be afraid of the devil. The devil didn't do it. Right. God is using it to grow you. Jesus comes. He's bringing peace against himself. And he's saying, I am going to be the sacrifice. I'm going to be the peace of God that causes you to have peace with him. The Bible says right here, they were crying out. They were singing it and didn't even realize it. They were singing peace in the highest. See, God doesn't want to give you peace on earth. He wants to give you peace as he gives, not as the earth gives. He wants to give you peace with himself so that you could boldly come before the throne of grace so you can walk in a dad's office so he can wrap his arms around you and so he could have relationship, not religion. Relationship he came for.
He came that you could have purpose and destiny. And our purpose is to let God untie us and say, God, make my life a vehicle for your glory. Now, here's what we do. We're in the parade, right? God's appointing us to greatness. You know what happens most of the time halfway through the parade as they're singing Hosanna? We start believing that they're singing over the donkey. Oh, wow. Look at all these people showing up the fearless. I must be a great preacher. Wow, look at all these people. I must be doing so. I have something figured out. Wow, woe is me. God, I don't really need you. Uh, I'm just going to kind of come uh, figure this thing out on my own because, wow, look at all this praise the donkey's getting. And we start allowing the worship of the donkey rather than the worship on the same. Look, they're not shout you're not shouting over me. You're not here because of me. You're here because I am simply a, look, I'm just a vehicle. You don't need me. You need him. Stop worshiping the pastor, preacher, teacher. Stop worshiping the Jesus that is on And he came when he did because he wanted them to know, I'm a king from a kingdom. And you couldn't get to my kingdom. So I came to yours. And I didn't come to hang out. I came to take over. And here's what I want to do. See, the Bible says that in the fullness of time, Jesus came when time was ready. When time hit now, Jesus came. And the Holy Spirit did as well. In the upper room, it was God's setup of the new kings that would rule on his behalf in their land. You see, God has called you to be a king. I was in Africa recently, and we were getting all this food. They had this buffet that was incredible. I mean, I can make your mouth water because I know it's like lunchtime right now because they had this line, a line just for salad dressings. Every kind of salad dress. I don't even like salad, but I'm gonna like, I'm gonna try some of the honey bisque, bacon flavored, uh, wheat. You know, uh, no no uh, growth hormones uh, salad dressing. I, I need to try some some of that. I, and then and then the, just after the salad dressing, there was a pudding line. Just pudding, any kind of pudding. I had never seen some of these puddings. Carrots in it. Uh, chi- I mean, bacon in the pudding. Anybody know that bacon is a good thing? Is a heavenly substance. They had a coffee line. They, and me and my wife were there, and we're, we, it was like $5. $5. I'm like, can I just move here? L.A. is killing me. I'm, $5. And I've got all, I got like a plate, and then I turn the corner, and there's like another buffet. And I'm like, okay, I guess I'll get a third plate and a fourth plate. And pretty soon, like, these people were helping me carry around my plates. And I looked at the guy, and I kind of felt guilty because here we are in Africa, and I got like 20 plates of food. And I looked at him, he could tell in my eyes, I was like, oh man, I think I got too much food. And I go, man, I, I kind of feel like a king. So I just, I just like a king's feast and I'm just feasting. And he goes, sir, you are a king. And all of a sudden when he said that, something shook inside of me. Something from the core of the way I was created and the way I was designed. It was almost as if the Holy Spirit was speaking through this random person that I met for the first time. He said, sir, you are a king. Because my Bible says Jesus is the king of So who are the kings? You think it's Prince William? Think that's what he's talking about? No, you. Because he's not talking about this earth's kingdom. He's talking about his. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You know what the Holy Spirit was? It was, your, it was you being kinged. It was you being kinged. It was the Holy Spirit coming and giving you the power and authority Look, you don't have to fight. You're a king. (laughs) He'll send his warring angels on your behalf. You have an army that is waiting on you to command them. An army that's waiting on you to say, darkness, you need to leave my city now in the name of Jesus. Look, can I tell you this? God's not going to remove fear from your life. Why? Because he gave you the power to do it. He gave you the power to not just remove it, to grow stronger than it, What do kings do? Kings conquer. Kings rule over things. Can I ask you this? What are you ruling over? What have you conquered? Because if not, you have a crown, but you haven't been walking out the authority that has been given with your crown. God came to set up a kingdom on earth. He doesn't want to take the people out and put them in heaven. He wants his kings to set up shop. He's going, hey, we're the Romans. Come here. Rich looks like a Roman. Come here right? You've been trained. 
You've been prepared. Now I'm sending you as an ambassador. I want you to go to the land that does not know who we are. It does not know how much they're loved. I want you to go do as the Romans do, right where they're at, where they don't do as the Romans do. I want you to show them that what we do in Rome is how it should be. I want you to walk out light in darkness. I want you to walk out love and hate. It's okay that you're gonna be surrounded by people that are not like you. It's okay, that's the perfect place to be. You are my representative, and here's the deal. You got my backing. Can I tell you this? You're not a king because of what you did. You're not a king because of how you worshiped or, or what you earned. You are a king. Kings don't become kings because they, they, uh, they, they did something right. Like, oh, hey, you were the best performer, so why don't you be our king? No, you become a king because of birth. You become a king because your dad was a king. And your dad before that was a king. You see, here's the deal. You have to catch that you are, chi- you are children of God. You are heirs to who God's called. He has called you king. He has asked you to set up shop right where you're at, in your business, and in your household, in your family, in your music, in your writing, in your photography. God has not called you to rule over them with hate. He's called you to rule over this city with love. He wants to use you wants to use you in power. Where is, where has he placed you? Wherever it is, he's already made peace with himself for you. He's untied you. He's saying, would you be my vehicle that we could change everything with? We're kings. Why are we still acting like slaves? Kings. I I think it's funny that all the religious people thought Jesus shouldn't have rode a donkey. I I love it that they thought he should have used a horse. Because no one thought I should be here either. But God didn't choose the thing that everybody else thought he should choose. He chose who he chose. He has a different eyesight on you. And he's chose you for a reason to change history. And he's going to put his story into your history. And he's going to use you to see God come to this earth. If you're in a dark place, wave at me. If you're in a dark environment, wave at me. You work in a dark environment. You have a dark household. You live in a dark part of the city. God wants to use you. You are a king. Quit let the devil rob you. We are not at war with the devil. God didn't come make to make peace with the devil. He came to make peace with himself, and he's already done it. So don't let the devil remind you of who you used to be. You are called. You are chosen for such a time as this. Welcome to your new life. Jesus, I pray for fire to hit this room. Holy Spirit, Lord, I cloak this generation with power and authority to walk you into this city, God. Lord, we walk slowly, God, with the precious cargo of you, Holy Spirit, into every environment into our family, into our lives. Would you stand up to your feet all over this room? Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come. You would empower us. Many people get mixed up in their call. They think they're called to sing. They think they're called to preach. They think they're called to start a business. That is not your call. That is a small call in comparison to the call of Christ. The call is simply to say, Jesus, use my life. Appoint my life. Whatever you have plans for. God, I just want to be a vehicle that you come into this village with. God, he might use the singing. He might use the preaching, but he might also use your storms. He might also use you getting fired from a job. He might also use the things you don't want to face. He might also use the the small days to become big days. When you say, Jesus, right here, right now, God, I came that you would appoint my life to something great. Maybe you're in this room and you're chasing the American dream. Why not allow the call? that's been chasing you 
to activate your life. Why not have a good day every day? Why not be able to smile in the rain? Why not be able to shout in the storm? You see what the enemy's doing to me right now? I'm untying the colt, and he's yelling at me. Why are you taking that? Why are you untying that? You know what I'm going to tell him? The Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. The Lord has need of it. I'm sorry that this person doesn't fit into your box. I'm sorry that they used to be tied up in drugs. I'm sorry that they used to be tied up in fear. The Lord has need of you. The Lord has need of you. The Lord has a call. He has a destiny, Nick. Come here, Nick. Come here. Come here, bro. Come here. Come here. The Lord has a call. Why? Why, Nick? Why, Nick? The Lord has need of you, bro. He has called you. To, would you just lift your hands? Holy Spirit, I pray for new fire, new life. Jesus, mighty warrior. Nick, you don't have to do anything. All you have to do is say, Jesus, I'm available. I'm available, and I'm untying you right now. Nick, I untie you from all insecurity. I untie you from all fear. I untie you from what they said about you, what they thought about you, and I untie you from yourself. I untie you from the limitations you put on you. And I say, today, God wants to appoint you to change the world. He's appointed. JP, come here. Walk down here. I'm untying you right now. I'm untying you from, oh, you should have did it then. It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. Every day, I want to use you. Every day, I've appointed you. I have showed up in time. I have not passed you. I have not forgotten you. He sent me to untie you today. I untie you today. Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, I cloak him. I put on a cloak. I know this is kind of silly, but I'm just going to do it. Holy Spirit, I'm going to listen to you. I cloak him right now. Lord, I cloak him right now, God, with the mantle and the anointing that you put on my life. I cover him, God. I stand by him, God. Lord, that he could be ridden into a city. Lord, I put a cloak of your word in between who he used to be and who he's called to be. Father, Lord, use him in mighty power. Today was the start of something new. Today was the beginning of something. Your story will change others. Fire, Holy Spirit. Rule over it. Rule over it. Rule over the faculties of your mind. Rule over what the devil keeps saying. You know what we need to tell the devil? Every time he keeps telling us, tie yourself back up, we need to tell him this. The Lord has need of my life. I'm sorry, devil. I would go back. But, but I only have one life, and for this reason I came, and for this reason I live, for this reason I'm here. You know what I'm going to tell you now? You know what today's about? Going back into the village. God did not start in the temple. He started in the village. And when he got to the temple, he's like, oh, okay, cool. And he left. <laughs> because he didn't come to hang out in the temple. He came to die at Golgotha, place of the stone, where sinners mocked, soldiers gambled, and disciples ran. Jesus came to die out where the people are, in between two thieves, in fact, that one would find life because he stood next to him. I want to pray over you today. I want to cloak you today with these words, that when you go out into this city, you would carry the light of all lights, that you would not forget that you are not alone in this race. That you would not forget that just be, look, donkeys bite and they're stubborn. <laughs> I found that out about sheep too. We're donkeys. So what I get from church today, I'm a donkey. But I'm the one that God called to ride into the city. We're stubborn and we don't like people to get close to us. Right? But I don't want you to forget donkey that you're not there alone. You are carrying the glory of God. When your boss freaks out, when the religion starts saying, here's all the rules, I thought you were a Christian. I say, well, I'm going to keep praising him. I'm going to keep praising him. If I don't, the rocks will cry out. The rocks will cry out, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to let the rocks cry out because this is my job to cry out to God, to, to be a, you know what worship is? Worship was the donkey coming into town with the presence of God. You know what worship, your worship doesn't start with the band playing and the songs on the screen. Worship is our lives. We are called to be living sacrifices for God. You know what this week when your boss freaks out, just worship Jesus. Just go, okay, cool. 
I know you're not hating me. You're actually hating the one that's, that I'm a vehicle for. You're hating on Jesus, but he can handle your hate because he can conquer it with love. When, when your family starts ridiculing you, when, when your job shuts down, when finances tell you you have to run away, I want you just to say, you know what? Jesus has need of it. Jesus has need of my moment right now, and I'm going to praise him, not because it's Palm Sunday week. I'm going to praise him because he deserves all the praise because he's not a religious leader he's the king of glory amen amen the bible says that jesus made his entrance into the city on a donkey uh, so unlikely it seems like it would have been more fitting for him to come in on a horse which would have meant he's a conquering king but yet he came on something that was just not really useful. Um, it, the Bible says in Matthew that this donkey had been tied up. Who knows how long this donkey was ever really used for anything. It was really kind of worthless to people. But all of a sudden, Jesus sent two disciples to untie this donkey so that this animal could be used, it hadn't been used at all, been tied up, but could be used for one of the greatest moments in all of history. I just begin to think of how many times we think we're just tied up, you know, and uh, I, I'm unqualified. I, I look at my past, look at, look at my mistakes, look at, look at my fear, look at how I failed and look at how I've never done everything right. How could God really use me? But yet look at what he does in this story. I feel like in this story, I'm the donkey and you and I are the donkey. Like, we're this animal that, we're this person that almost like, we feel like God can't use me because of this, but God still wants to really, that's a lie, because God wants to actually use us for one of the greatest things. You may not understand it, but he loves using broken people. He, he loves using people that don't ever feel like they can do it because that's when God gets the most glory and gets the most honor. I love it. He wants to use you. He, he's going, I'm sending people to untie you and help you out. And, and I love it because after you've actually realized who you are and that God can use me despite how broken and frail I am, it doesn't stop there because as he sent two people to break open and, and untie this animal, I believe we have the power inside of us to unlock and untie the potential and power in other people. Uh, people all around you, wherever you're at in your job, as we speak, um, you're around people that are just tied up. Tied up in, in fear, tied up in insecurity, tied up in situations that are just too big for them to handle. And they think, how can, how can I ever get out of this? And how can ever God use my life? And you have the power to unlock the greatness inside of someone else. I just pray this message ministers to you today and that it, it's touched your life and brought a lot of revelation. Not only does God want to break open and free us so he can use us because of everything he's brought us from, we can free others because of our freedom. He is, he is, he's empowered you today to do some incredible things. If you could almost just get the revelation, you don't have to be good enough. You don't have to have a perfect life. That's legalism and that's religion. He just says, I want you as you are in your brokenness. Look at what you're doing in your brokenness. I can use that and that is powerful. And you are meant to unlock other people, amen. And so let's just pray. Uh, I hope this word touched you today. Lord Jesus, we ask God, Lord, I thank you, God, for your power and your, your presence, Lord. If we've underestimated ourselves, God, because of our past, because of what uh, we've done and our sin and all those things that we've, we've fallen and, and we haven't arrived. And, but God, I, you're not looking for people that are perfect. You're looking for people who are obedient, God. And I just ask that we would continue to walk in that. And not only that, but that you've empowered us to bring the love and the freedom and victory to others and, and unlock them out of their cages, God. And I just ask that we would do that in Jesus' name. Amen.